Hello, I'm Dr. Hope Rugo from the University of California, San Francisco. It's a great pleasure to talk to you today about optimizing therapy in HER2 positive breast cancer. We'll talk about early stage and late stage disease and focus on the questions. Trastuzumab has improved outcomes for patients with early stage HER2 positive breast cancer during the last decade, and we now have a better understanding of how to most appropriately identify patients who will benefit with accurate testing. The major questions ahead of us in early stage disease is when we can use less therapy and when which patients need more therapy. When we're thinking about less therapy, we'd like to get rid of anthracyclines in patients who don't need that additional therapy. We also would like to understand the optimal duration of adjuvant trastuzumab and treat our patients who need less therapy with a less intensive chemotherapy regimen. We have three relatively new agents that we can now use in the adjuvant setting. Which patients need these therapies, including pertuzumab, TDM1, and neratinib? What about in the metastatic setting? We know that we have had an unmet need of improving options for patients with brain metastases, but we now have therapy that appears to be improving outcome for these patients. We know that even with targeted therapies, resistance occurs, and we need to understand how to best sequence the newly approved therapies to catnip, capecitabine, and trastuzumab from her 2 climb trastuzumab deruxtecan from the DESTINY-1 trial, and neratinib in the NALA trial. Also, we'll briefly review some of the ongoing trials in the metastatic setting. Well, we know that achieving a pathologic complete response in the neoadjuvant setting correlates with improved disease-free survival and overall survival. This shows you a number of different clinical trials testing different chemotherapy and targeted agent combinations in HER2-positive early-stage breast cancer. Most recently, we saw data from the NEOSphere trial that looked at pathologic complete response in both breast and axillary nodes and showed a five-year progression-free survival of 85% in patients who achieved a PCR, even though patients received anthracyclines regardless of PCR after surgery. In the patients who did not achieve a PCR, the disease-free survival was still 76% at five years, suggesting that some patients indeed need additional therapy, but many patients will be treated appropriately and will be apparently cured even with failure to achieve a PCR with HER2-positive early-stage breast cancer. This may be due to continued therapy in the post-adjuvant setting the post-neoadjuvant setting, and indeed, in the NEOSphere trial, patients received three cycles of anthracycline after surgery, which probably accounts for the better-than-expected disease-free survival. If we keep this in mind and we look at the trials across time, uh, let's think about how to best apply neoadjuvant therapy. Well, here's the data from NEOSphere. This trial was a randomized phase two study, but led to accelerated approval of pertuzumab added to trastuzumab and chemotherapy-based treatment in the neoadjuvant setting because of the remarkable improvement in pathologic complete response shown here in the intent to treat population at 46%. In addition, of course, this was added on to the already approval of pertuzumab in the metastatic setting based on the Cleopatra regimen, which showed both an improvement in progression-free survival and overall survival adding pertuzumab to docetaxel chemotherapy in the first-line metastatic setting. What's interesting about the NEOSphere trial is that the pathologic complete response rate was 29% in patients receiving trastuzumab and docetaxel and 24% with pertuzumab and docetaxel. We also saw an impressive PCR rate of 17% in patients receiving antibody therapy alone, but of course this is significantly lower than 46% with just a taxane and the addition of pertuzumab to trastuzumab, so we don't use the antibody combination alone in any setting uh, as the primary therapy for HER2-positive breast cancer. If you look at patients based on both node negativity and node positivity, there is clearly a, a, a 
uh, reduction in the number of patients with node positive disease at surgery with the addition of pertuzumab, which is very encouraging. And then you can see that there was benefit in patients regardless of hormone receptor status, but the benefit in patients with hormone receptor positive disease was significantly lower. These patients, as I mentioned earlier, received three cycles of an anthracycline-based chemotherapy, as well as trastuzumab for a year. So indeed, the patients had a better disease-free survival because of additional therapy in the post-neoadjuvant setting. One of the questions that has come up is what the appropriate treatment to give patients in the post-neoadjuvant setting who failed to achieve a pathologic complete response. And we'll talk about the Catherine data with TDM1 in just a moment. So based on this data, who should we consider for preoperative systemic therapy in patients with uh, early stage breast cancer? Patients with HER2 positive early stage breast cancer who have tumors of two centimeters or greater or who have node positive disease should receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy with a doublet antibody uh, approach with trastuzumab and pertuzumab. We don't really know, and we'll talk about the affinity data in just a moment, which patients need an entire year of double antibody therapy and which patients would do as well with trastuzumab alone. Uh, but we just don't have data to answer that question. And at the moment, patients who achieve a PCR generally receive continued therapy with double antibody treatment to complete a year of therapy. The question is which patients could be treated with only a taxane and could avoid anthracycline therapy in the neoadjuvant setting. And we'll talk about two different approaches that might help us answer that question in just a moment. In terms of other patients who have uh, early stage breast cancer, I believe that most patients who have triple negative disease should receive neoadjuvant therapy because this helps us deliver the most, uh, the, uh, most effective therapy and help patients have a, a better uh, long-term disease-free survival. Also, of course, patients who have more locally advanced disease and who have high-risk disease by gene expression panels who have hormone receptor positive breast cancer should also be considered for neoadjuvant therapy. So let's talk about some of the data that help inform us about which patients could avoid anthracyclines, which patients might be treated with less chemotherapy, and which patients are more appropriately treated with more treatment after surgery. We know that anthracyclines had remarkable benefit when we first identified HER2 as a marker that should be uh, evaluated in early stage disease. When we looked retrospectively at trials that had included anthracyclines versus those that did not, we found that patients with HER2 positive disease had remarkable benefit from anthracycline-based therapy. But now we use trastuzumab, we really need to understand uh, whether or not all patients need anthracyclines. In addition, the benefit of pertuzumab may further reduce the added benefit of using anthracyclines. Why should we avoid anthracyclines? They do have a small but real risk of cardiac toxicity in the 2 to 3% range. And in addition, there is a tiny about 0.3 to 0.1 to 0.3% risk of secondary leukemias. Cardiac risk factors clearly matter in assessing the risk of a cardiac toxicity with trastuzumab based uh, with uh, anthracycline based therapies in patients treated with trastuzumab based therapies, including age, the use of antihypertensive, and the baseline ejection fraction. So we the BCIRG006 trial and the TRAIN2 trial can inform us about whether or not all patients need uh, to receive anthracyclines. In the uh, BCRG006 trial, we evaluated the addition of trastuzumab to either an anthracycline-based regimen, ACT, or a non-anthracycline-based regimen with docetaxel and carboplatin called TCH. As you can see, the rate of distant metastases was relatively similar, regardless of the use of an anthracycline, and the rate of congestive heart failure was 1.6% higher in patients receiving anthracyclines there was no difference in the rate of acute leukemia. This data gave us the first information that we could potentially safely avoid anthracyclines in some patients who had HER2-positive early-stage breast cancer, but there was still doubt in some people's minds. And then most recently, we saw data from the TRAIN2 trial. This trial had been originally uh, already 
uh, published with data on pathologic complete response showing identical PCR, whether or not an anthracycline based regimen was used with uh, epirubicin as shown uh, here with three cycles of epirubicin and continued uh, treatment uh, through anthracycline therapy with a HER2 targeted treatment. Or you could avoid this while using a, a taxane, carboplatin, and trastuzumab based regimen. The TRAIN2 trial is a little bit different from other studies because nine cycles of chemotherapy was given to all patients, which is longer than we generally give patients and longer than was given in the BCIRG006 trial. The primary endpoint was PCR, as previously published, but in addition, of course, relapse-free survival was evaluated. Most patients uh, completed one year of trastuzumab, but more completed this uh, treatment in the non-anthracycline arm, with a difference of 97% uh, for the non-anthracycline arm versus 89% for the anthracycline arm. There was significantly more grade 3-4 febrile neutropenia in the anthracycline arm at 10% versus 1%. 64% of patients had node positive disease and 42% had hormone receptor negative disease, I think fairly representing the patients we generally see in practice. Here's the data presented at ASCO in event-free survival. There was absolutely no difference in event-free survival comparing the anthracycline versus the non-anthracycline regimen. Again, I think this data uh, presents very important data in the uh, era of pertuzumab added to neoadjuvant chemotherapy that we can safely use a non-anthracycline regimen and obtain the same excellent results that we've seen in uh, patients who received anthracycline-based regimens with less cardiac toxicity uh, and a better ability to achieve an entire year of HER2-targeted therapy uh, exposure. What about using a shorter duration of trastuzumab? Five different studies have looked at shorter durations of trastuzumab in the adjuvant setting, two trials with nine weeks, and three trials with six versus 12 months, all compared, of course, to one year. The largest trials have looked at six versus 12 months of trastuzumab-based therapy. In the Persephone trial, we saw treatment with over 4,000 patients and the FAIR trial with more than 3,000 patients. What's important in assessing non-inferiority, the endpoint for all of these trials, is what the margins, the preset margins for non-inferiority non are. In the Persephone trial, the widest margins were set for non-inferiority, and this was demonstrated based on a presentation in ASCO 2018. Narrower margins for non-inferiority were set for the FAIR trial, and there, non-inferiority was not reached. In a discussion regarding these trials, which Martine Picard gave after the results were presented for Persephone, I, she noted that we really want to continue to see the same excellent survival data uh, with uh, trastuzumab-based therapy. Because the margins were wider with Persephone, in general, one year of trastuzumab remains the standard of care. However, the patients who had very low-risk disease, node-negative small tumors, appeared to have a similar benefit in almost all of the trials that looked at this subset. So if you had a patient with a small tumor and low-risk HER2-positive disease, or a patient who develops cardiac toxicity, six months provides very good benefit, uh, six months of trastuzumab in the adjuvant setting. Now, which are the patients that we could treat with less intensive chemotherapy and, of course, a non-anthracycline-based regimen? We initially designed this trial with the idea that patients who receive paclitaxel in, with trastuzumab in the neoadjuvant setting, some have a very good response and had no tumor by the time we were thinking about continuing with an anthracycline-based regimen. The APT trial tried to assess the benefit of a short course of chemotherapy with one-year duration of trastuzumab in patients who had low-risk disease. These patients were defined as tumors less than three centimeters and in general node negative disease. Patients who had micrometastases in one lymph node were added later into the trial and represented only 2% of the population. As you can see here, the majority of patients who were enrolled in the APT trial had T1B or T1C disease. Patients were treated with 12 weeks of standard weekly paclitaxel and a year of trastuzumab. 
Here's the data as published in the JCO by Sarah Tulaney in 2019, showing that uh, the seven-year disease-free survival was 93.3%, and indeed, a very few patients had any distant recurrences. The benefit of trastuzumab with 12 weeks of paclitaxel was maintained even in patients who had hormone receptor positive versus negative disease, shown in the right-hand curves. The toxicity from paclitaxel for 12 weeks in trastuzumab was very modest, with the primary issue for patients being peripheral neuropathy and alopecia. Alopecia can be completely prevented with the use of cold caps. We most recently saw data from the ATTEMPT trial uh, presented by Sarah Tulaney in San Antonio of 2019. This trial, which we also participated in, compared TDM1 for one year versus the APT regimen in a three-to-one randomization. Each arm standard stood on its own so that we didn't compare TDM1 to the APT regimen because of the three-to-one randomization. We did, however, see an excellent outcome with every three-week TDM1 for one year with a three-year disease-free survival rate of almost 98%. There was more discontinuation due to toxicity in patients receiving TDM1 than the standard APT regimen, uh, but there was less grade two or greater peripheral neuropathy and less alopecia. This trial really begged a question of whether or not we just are treating for too long using TDM1 for one year. Patients enrolled in ATTEMPT had stage one disease, so all patients had tumors of two centimeters or smaller and no negative breast cancer. More patients had hormone receptor positive disease than hormone receptor negative disease. Maybe in these patients, six months of TDM1 is sufficient therapy, and this would be an extremely well-tolerated regimen with minimal toxicity. This is a question that may be answered in an upcoming trial to be opened towards the end of the year. What about the recent additions to our adjuvant treatments in early stage breast cancer? We've already talked about pertuzumab, but we'll review the affinity data, the, the Extinet trial looking at extended adjuvant neuratinib, and the Catherine trial looking at TDM1 in patients who failed to achieve a pathologic complete response with standard neoadjuvant therapy. Neratinib and uh, pertuzumab were approved in 2017, and TDM1 was approved in 2019 in these specific settings. How do we apply new data? All of these uh, data sets showed significant improvements in disease-free survival, but can be associated with an increase in toxicity. So let's talk about how much benefit can be expected for individual patients adding pertuzumab to standard trastuzumab-based therapy in the adjuvant setting, using TDM1 for patients with residual disease after neoadjuvant therapy, and by extending adjuvant therapy with one year of neratinib. We'll talk about the Extinet trial first, since this was the first approval in 2017. Patients who had been treated with adjuvant trastuzumab uh, for one year, and of course had received chemotherapy, were randomized at the end of that year to receive neratinib or placebo for an additional year of therapy. An amendment during the course of the therapy restricted enrollment to patients with no positive disease who had completed trastuzumab less than or equal to one year before randomization. Initially, patients were included who had completed trastuzumab up to two years before randomization. The primary endpoint was invasive disease-free survival at two years, and that was the primary analysis showing a benefit in patients receiving neuratinib versus placebo, particularly in patients with hormone receptor positive disease. This was a stratification for the trial, and in addition, uh, stratification was based on node status and adjuvant trastuzumab regimen. This uh, trial, because it showed a benefit at two years, was extended with uh, the uh, additional uh, evaluation uh, provided at five years of, uh, after five years of ongoing therapy, uh, ongoing analysis in patients in the early stage setting. This is an interesting trial because of acquisition by uh, different companies over the course of the trial of neuratinib. Uh, the primary endpoint was uh, initially curtailed at two years, but extended to five years by the, second, the last company that obtained neuratinib, the uh, Puma company. Uh, 
in the five-year update, patients were uh, consented uh, for a further evaluation for disease-free survival uh, after a follow-up. And this would have uh, resulted in an additional uh, three years of follow-up after the two-year initial endpoint. Almost all patients were able to be evaluated at the five-year endpoint. This data that was published in 2017 uh, showed, as you can see here, an improvement in the uh, invasive disease-free survival at five years favoring neratinib, but the difference was still quite uh, small. If we looked at patients based on hormone receptor status, you can see that there was a 4.4% absolute benefit favoring neratinib in patients with hormone receptor positive disease, where there didn't appear to be any benefit in patients with hormone receptor negative disease, with a hazard ratio of 0.95. Of course, in 2017, in the United States, neratinib was approved regardless of hormone receptor status, but most patient, most uh, providers in practice use neratinib only in patients with hormone receptor positive disease based on this data. Although certainly you could justify using neratinib in patients with very uh, advanced uh, high risk hormone receptor negative disease. What about looking at additional endpoints? These actually were uh, additional factors that were evaluated in a post hoc nature and really uh, need to be used as hypothesis generating data. Patients who had hormone receptor positive disease who had completed their trastuzumab less than one year uh, before starting treatment with neratinib or placebo on the extinet trial had an absolute benefit in invasive disease free survival of 5.1%. Interestingly, again, hypothesis generating, patients who had a hormone receptor positive disease who had completed the, their trastuzumab less than one year before study entry and who did not have a PCR after neoadjuvant treatment had an absolute benefit of 7.4% in terms of invasive disease-free survival. Again, very impressive information uh, favoring neratinib in patients with high-risk disease in this post-hoc analysis. What about toxicity? This was the major issue in the treatment of patients in the Extinet trial with significant grade three diarrhea during the course of the trial. Because of this, the control trial was designed to look at a variety of different approaches to control diarrhea in patients receiving extended adjuvant therapy with neratinib using the same criteria that were used in the Extinet trial. Patients received loperamide, budesonide and loperamide, cholestopol and loperamide, cholestopol and PRN loperamide, and then interestingly in the last two cohorts, a dose escalation scheme of neratinib where patients received a lower dose uh, in two, for two weeks, then a slightly higher dose for two weeks, and then went on to the full dose neratinib after one month in 60 patients. As you can see, the dose escalation scheme appeared to result in the best control of grade three diarrhea, down to 15%, the lowest rate seen so far, with a uh, shift of diarrhea down to grade one and grade two. This could be easily controlled with the addition of as-needed loperamide. And then the median cumulative duration of uh, grade three diarrhea is quite short at uh, only two days, um, and grade two was shorter at about five days. Discontinuation due to diarrhea was markedly redu reduced in the dose escalation schema, uh, which uh, only was 3.3%, and no patients were hospitalized due to diarrhea. This suggests that when we're treating patients with neratinib, we should use this dose escalation schema, regardless of the setting in which we use neratinib, the early stage or metastatic setting. And we'll talk about the NALA trial briefly in the metastatic setting as well. This, in addition, makes neratinib a more uh, feasible treatment in patients who might benefit from this therapy. But who benefits now from neratinib? We need to understand that in the context of the affinity study, adding pertuzumab to trastuzumab in the adjuvant setting, and the Catherine trial adding TDM1 to patients who failed to achieve a pathologic complete response after neoadjuvant therapy. The Affinity trial was a randomized phase three trial that randomized patients to receive standard chemotherapy and trastuzumab with either pertuzumab or placebo. They expanded the trial after initial accrual to include more patients with node positive disease to try and amplify the ability to see a benefit from the addition of pertuzumab because we have such excellent outcome in patients with node negative disease with trastuzumab and chemotherapy alone. 
This shows you the, the uh, second interim analysis with 6.2 years of median follow-up, or 74 months. Here you can see in the intent to treat analysis, there's a 2.8% overall benefit from the addition of pertuzumab, with 90.6% of patients with pertuzumab being free of invasive events. Overall survival is still immature at about 94% for both arms, which is really a, a great uh, data set showing how well patients are doing now with trastuzumab-based therapy for early stage HER2-positive breast cancer. Let's look at the subsets, though, to see whether or not we can see a better outcome in certain subsets. The primary benefit for adding pertuzumab to standard adjuvant trastuzumab-based chemotherapy in the AFFINITY trial was in node-positive disease, regardless of hormone receptor status. Here you can see an absolute benefit of 4.5% in patients with node-positive disease. I'll summarize this data further in the next slide. This, uh, the AFFINITY trial now at uh, six, over six years of follow-up represents 2.4 years of additional follow-up from the initial interim analysis. This represents the important longer follow-up in higher risk node positive patients that were added on to the trial in protocol B and where follow-up was very short in the initial interim analysis. Affinity overall has a low risk population, and we have seen that in these patients, invasive disease free survival benefit increases with longer follow up. We know now that pertuzumab benefits patients with node positive disease, regardless of hormone receptor status, and overall survival results are early at six years with less than 50% of the required events. What about adding TDM1 to patients who do not achieve a pathologic complete response with standard? neoadjuvant chemotherapy, primarily with trastuzumab. The Catherine trial randomized patients one-to-one -to, -one to receive TDM1 or continued trastuzumab in the adjuvant setting. All patients had to have residual disease after neoadjuvant therapy. This shows you the data from the Catherine trial. In these patients, 70% uh, whom had hormone receptor positive disease, and most of whom received trastuzumab and not pertuzumab, there was a marked improvement in three-year invasive disease-free survival in patients receiving TDM1, with an absolute difference of 11%. This is really remarkable, and if you look at the forest plot to the right on this curve, you can see that the benefit was seen regardless of whether patients had hormone receptor positive disease, whether or not they had node positive or node negative disease, and interestingly, whether or not they received pertuzumab. This represented about 20% of the total trial population. When we look at patients who had a very little bit of disease remaining at the time of surgery, we're also seeing a benefit. <clears throat> Here you can see patients who had smaller tumors, T1B and T1C. It appears that the benefit is greater in patients who had uh, at least one centimeter or greater disease at the time of surgery, if you look at the less than T1C patients, but then this may just be a, a matter of numbers where actually you're seeing a smaller number of patients who had a very tiny amount of disease remaining. Does this mean that all patients with residual disease should receive TDM1? Well, most patients should based on this data. However, a patient who has less than one millimeter of invasive disease at the time of surgery would probably have more toxicity from receiving TDM1 than ongoing trastuzumab, and you would expect these patients to have an excellent outcome. So I think the question really arises whether or not patients who have less than five millimeters of disease remaining at the time of surgery really need TDM1. Whether or not we'll really understand the answer to this question or not remains to be seen, and I think this has to be an individual patient decision. Patients overall tolerated TDM1 well, but there was clearly more toxicity with TDM1 than trastuzumab. What about the events seen uh, in the Catherine trial? Well, this actually leads to another area of investigation. Uh, the primary reduction in uh, events was in distant recurrence. And you can see here, uh, this was 15.9 uh, versus 10.5%. But if you look at this, uh, you can see that without CNS events, you're still seeing a marked reduction in uh, distant recurrence. The difference in CNS events, however, was not significant. Uh, providing TDM1 versus trastuzumab in the post-neoadjuvant setting uh, did not impact CNS events. They were identical between the two arms. 
Uh, so that suggests that this is an ongoing unmet need, as we discussed earlier. And we'll talk about a trial that might that is trying to address that unmet need. I mentioned that more there was more toxicity in the TDM1 arm. And what I think what's striking here is that we saw the benefit in TDM1, even though 18% of patients discontinued due to adverse events versus 2% for trastuzumab. So potentially a shorter duration of TDM1 is still beneficial in these patients. How should we address the unmet need of uh, CNS events, even in patients who do not achieve a pathologic complete response to neoadjuvant or two based therapy? We actually see CNS recurrences rarely, even in patients who achieve a PCR. Well, this trial is actually quite fascinating. It's first looking at de-escalating therapy with THP uh, using a uh, APT type regimen, but with pertuzumab for, uh, with 12 weeks of paclitaxel and four doses of trastuzumab and pertuzumab with an ecog acrin type uh, study. Patients who achieve a PCR receive no additional therapy. So this is looking at completely eliminating both carboplatin as well as an anthracycline. If patients have residual disease, regardless of whether or not they participated in the econ ecog Akron study, they can be randomized to receive a Catherine-like regimen with TDM1 and placebo or TDM1 and tucatinib that we'll discuss in just a moment um, in the her 2 climb trial showed a marked improvement in outcome in patients with brain metastases. This, I think, is a really exciting study design. We may be able to completely eliminate CNS recurrences in patients who have our early stage HER2 positive disease who fail to achieve a pathologic complete response to neoadjuvant therapy. Whether or not this is the case, we'll have to wait a few years to see. Now here's a uh, proposed algorithm for managing patients with early stage HER2 positive breast cancer. Patients who have very small tumors could be treated with uh, surgery and a trastuzumab based therapy with paclitaxel and uh, trastuzumab or paclitaxel carboplatin and trastuzumab with one year of trastuzumab based therapy. Certainly patients uh, with higher risk disease could be considered for a neoadjuvant therapy even with small tumors. I think generally people use a cutoff of about one centimeter in order to determine whether or not patients should be treated in the neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting, because I think that if you treat patients with a T1A B tumors and node negative disease in the neoadjuvant setting, you might overtreat some patients. In other words, use more carboplatin that's needed, and you might use more pertuzumab than is needed. In patients who have a T1C disease that's node negative, you need to assess the risk and patient preference. Some patients could be treated with neoadjuvant therapy and some patients in the adjuvant setting, as we outlined already. When we treat in the neoadjuvant setting patients who have T1C disease, I think that you could consider treating these patients with a THP type regimen and avoid the carboplatin that we use for higher stage patients. I certainly would not use anthracyclines in this trial in this patient population uh, because of our data from the APT and ATTEMPT trials, suggesting that we can really treat these patients with a less toxic regimen. In patients who have larger tumors, so T2 or uh, greater, and patients with node positive disease, these patients should be treated in the neoadjuvant setting with TCHP. I think that the uh, regimen with ACTHP is still an important treatment for some patients, but I would take another approach. I would treat these patients with a paclitaxel, trastuzumab, pertuzumab regimen first. In patients who have no evidence of disease, you could go to surgery. In patients who still have residual disease, you could consider an anthracycline-based course before surgery to improve the rate of pathologic complete response. In the COMPASS trial, these patients will go to surgery and then receive TDM1 or not uh, based on their pathologic complete response rate, thereby completely avoiding anthracyclines. TCHP could also be used in this type of regimen where you give TCHP for all six cycles and use TDM1 in those patients with residual disease, or you could give TCHP for three to four cycles, and in those patients who have a very poor response, consider anthracyclines before surgery. Who should receive neratinib? Now patients will receive pertuzumab and TDM1 who have received neoadjuvant therapy. 
In those patients, it's unclear which patients will benefit from neratinib, but certainly we would restrict to hormone receptor positive disease and those with really extensive cancers, so more than four positive nodes, very large tumors. In patients receiving treatment in the adjuvant setting who don't have the benefit of receiving TDM1 because we don't know how they're responding, patients with a very high-risk disease could be considered for a year of extended therapy with neratinib. Now let's uh, move on to metastatic disease, but we first want to just briefly mention the fact that subcutaneous trastezumab and trastezumab pertezumab combined are now approved in the U.S. by the Federal Drug Administration, and certainly subcutaneous trastezumab has been used quite widely in the rest of the world. These are, approvals were based on equivalent efficacy and safety in neoadjuvant trials compared to IV dosing and can safely be used in both the adjuvant and metastatic settings in our patients, allowing them to uh, avoid continuous need for a port, which most of my patients don't like. There are also multiple trastuzumab biosimilars with equivalent efficacy in the adjuvant and metastatic setting and safety, and these are approved for clinical use and are, are in now in widespread use around the world. So we have new HER2-targeted agents now to incorporate into our treatment paradigms in metastatic disease. Let's talk about these agents. First, we'll talk about trastuzumab deruxtecan, an antibody drug conjugate that uh, has been studied in a number of different settings in an ongoing basis in the phase three, in phase three trials. However, the approval for trastuzumab deruxtecan uh, was based on an unmet clinical need. Trastuzumab deruxtecan was first tested in three different dose levels, but the higher dose levels proved to be associated with higher rates of interstitial lung disease, or ILD pneumonitis, and these, uh, this approach was dropped. An expansion was then performed in patients uh, with 5.4 milligram per kilogram dosing, and as you can see in this continuation stage, 130 patients were treated. 184 patients in total were enrolled at the 5.4 milligram per kilogram dosing schedule with this antibody drug conjugate that is given every three weeks intravenously. The primary endpoint was confirmed overall response rate by independent central imaging facility review, and of course, secondary endpoints were also included. Patients were enrolled who had HER2 positive disease centrally confirmed and had received prior TDM1 and of course, trastuzumab-based therapy. Here you can see what, patients, uh, what treatment patients received. About 66% of patients had received pertuzumab, and then of course, other treatments as well, and all patients had received trastuzumab and TDM1 because this was the eligibility. The median number of prior cancer regimens was five with a range from two to 17. This shows you this uh, really, I think, remarkable uh, waterfall plot, plot from Destiny Breast 01 with trastuzumab deruxtecan. The overall disease control rate was 97.3%, and the confirmed overall response rate was 60.9%. The clinical benefit rate for six months was over 75%. There's a short median time to response of less than two months, and the median duration of response was 15 months. 168 patients were uh, analyzed to provide this data that led to the FDA accelerated approval. Here you can see the progression-free survival of a really remarkable 16.4 months. And indeed, I have a patient who has ongoing treatment now for over two years uh, who uh, had TDM1 for just one year in the post-pertezumab setting. So clearly, this is a highly effective agent, even in patients who've been relatively heavily pretreated. The overall survival median has not yet been reached, which is really also quite striking. You can see that uh, the survival is very good ongoing with a median follow-up of 11 months. They looked at 24 patients who had brain metastases and the median progression-free survival in that group of patients was 18 months, but the number of patients, of course, was quite small. It's still encouraging data. Now, one of the major toxicities of concern with uh, TDXD, as it's been known, or trastuzumab deruxtecan, is interstitial lung disease. Here you can see that four patients in the 184 patients who were available for safety treated at the current approved dose of 5.4 milligrams per kilogram uh, was 2.2%, uh, with four patients dying of this complication. Otherwise, patients tended to have very a low-grade interstitial lung disease, and it was relatively uncommon. Only 21 patients had interstitial lung disease, grade one to, 
0.23, and a total of 25 patients out of 184 had any great event. This has led to a black box warning shown here, where patients who develop any grade interstitial lung disease should have their trastuzumab deruxtecan interrupted. Patients who have grade one disease, should con you should consider corticosteroid treatment. And in patients who've recovered to grade one in less than 28 days, you can start again and follow these patients very closely. In patients who've resolved at greater than one month, you need to reduce the dose one level. For patients who have grade two or greater interstitial lung disease, you need to permanently discontinue trastuzumab deruxtecan and promptly initiate corticosteroid treatment. It's hoped that by increasing awareness and treating earlier, discontinuing drug earlier, that we can completely avoid higher grade ILD in these patients. What about neratinib? Well, the NALA trial evaluated neratinib versus lapatinib combined with capecitabine in patients with progressing HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. They had to have received at least two lines of therapy and stable brain metastases were uh, allowed. Here you can see the prior treatment in these patients. Uh, most patients had received two prior lines of therapy for metastatic disease. A very small number of patients received uh, pertuzumab uh, with trastuzumab uh, as their only prior treatment. Uh, but if you, you can see here, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and TDM1 represented about a third of the patients, and a TDM1 uh, represented uh, combined with, uh, with or without pertuzumab about 50% of patients. Here you can see the progression-free survival that was improved by 2.2 months uh, and with a restricted means analysis at 24 months uh, in patients receiving uh, neratinib versus lapatinib. Uh, overall survival was not significant. In addition, there was a, a longer time to intervention for CNS metastases in patients who received neratinib. Uh, this is uh, shown here, and you can basically just look at the cumulative incidence of time to intervention, and less patients needed intervention who received neratinib at 22.8% versus 29% in patients receiving uh, lapatinib, and the prior treatment is shown here. Toxicity, of course, continued to be an issue because patients did not use our prophylaxis with uh, slow dose escalation with neratinib. 24% of patients had grade 3, 4 diarrhea, and all grade diarrhea was seen in 66%. Despite that, median duration of treatment was numerically longer with neratinib than lapatinib, uh, but discontinuation rate with neratinib uh, was actually decreased due to adverse events at 10.9% compared to the lapatinib arm of 14.5% because of the addition of loperamide uh, prophylactically in patients receiving neratinib with, uh, for many investigators. Now, lastly, the HER2 CLIMB study showed us really remarkable data with the addition of an oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor to catnib that has less activity to EGFR compared to neratinib and lapatinib. Patients who had HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer with prior trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and TDM1 uh, with brain meds allowed were randomized to receive to catnib or placebo with trastuzumab and capecitabine. The capecitabine dose was the tolerable 1,000 milligrams per meter squared dose of, uh, twice daily that we generally use in clinical practice. Here you can see the patients who were enrolled in this trial. They enrolled an impressive 198 patients who had brain metastases to the catnib arm. This was a two to one randomization. And you can see that uh, the median lines of prior therapy was three, uh, ranging from one to 14 in the metastatic setting. Hard to know what 14 are, actually. Uh, but uh, there you go. It's uh, people use creative thinking in their treatment. Here you can see the progression-free survival, which was dramatically better when patients who received ducatinib versus uh, placebo uh, in the HER2-CLIMB trial uh, at uh, 5.6 versus 7.8 months. What's interesting here is that the antibody was continued, and that may have made a very big difference in seeing this improvement in outcome uh, with potentially some additional impact of combining trastuzumab with the oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor. The hazard ratio was 0.54 here, even though the absolute difference was only 2.2 months. Here you can see the overall survival. Here we see even a greater difference in overall survival than we saw with progression-free survival favoring tucatinib versus placebo with a hazard ratio of 0.66, leading to a relative 34% reduction in the risk of death. 
And as for the PFS curves, you can see that the curves separate quite early uh, in this patient population. Uh, here's the PFS curve with a separation occurring before three months. And in the overall survival data, you can see that this separation is occurring quite early, less than six months after start of therapy. Now, importantly, they also evaluated the PFS in patients with brain metastases, showing a really remarkable improvement with a hazard ratio of 0.48, even better than what was seen in the overall population, a 52% relative reduction. And here you can see the median PFS in this uh, patient population of 5.4 versus 7.6 months. The most common adverse events in patients treated with tucatinib are shown here, with diarrhea seen most frequently of all toxicities. Thankfully, the number of patients with grade 3 diarrhea was relatively small, but 80% of patients had some degree of diarrhea. You don't use to need to use prophylactic treatment to prevent diarrhea in these patients. Actually, you can use a loperamide as needed, and monitoring diet and holding dose and dose reducing is a very effective way of monitoring this toxicity. There was an increase in low-grade nausea and a slight increase in uh, palmar plantar erythrodysesthesia. Why is this? Patients actually were exposed to drug for a much longer period of time. One toxicity to call out is an increase in AST and ALT. We do see an increase in transaminases with the addition of tucatinib, and this can be high-grade, as shown here, grade 3 in the, or greater in the dark color. This uh, can be easily managed by holding drug and then starting again at a lower dose. In patients who have very low grade increases in enzymes, holding the drug or continuing for grade one transaminase elevation is quite safe. There have been no cases of patients with fatal liver toxicity or significant increases in uh, bilirubin, although bilirubin increase can be seen in a low grade uh, manner. A subgroup analysis of patients with brain metastases was presented uh, at uh, ASCO this year by Nancy Lin and is published in the JCO. As I mentioned, 174 patients had active brain metastases and 117 had treated and stable brain mets. This included an untreated population and a patient's population who had been previously treated but had new lesions that didn't require urgent treatment. Here you can see the CNS PFS benefit in patients with brain metastasis, really remarkable, from 4.2 months to 9.9 .9 months. Uh, really a remarkable difference here in patients with uh, brain metastases alone. The other data we looked at was just progression in brain, uh, but if you had brain metastases at the uh, outset, you appeared to have really this uh, dramatic benefit. And then overall survival was also seen in patients with brain metastases, increasing by an impressive six months from 12 months to 18.9 months with a hazard ratio of 0.58. CNS progression-free survival and overall survival benefit were seen in both the stable and active brain meds uh, groups. And they also looked at data in patients who had progressed after stereotactic radiosurgery for the first CNS progression, and those patients had a better progression-free survival with tucatinib versus placebo in the triplet combination. This shows you emerging anti-HER2 therapies that we just discussed, trastuzumab deruxtecan, tucatinib in the triplet uh, combination, and neratinib in the doublet with capecitabine. I also have included the overall response in brain metastases that was presented at ASCO this year at 47% for tucatinib versus 20% uh, for placebo. Here, this allows you to compare the different results in patients with brain metastases and all patients. So how are we going to incorporate all of these agents that have recently been approved into the clinical setting? Well, uh, certainly, uh, and when we think about the clinical setting, what we would do generally is to uh, treat patients who have brain metastases after TDM1 and trastuzumab uh, with a tucatinib-based regimen, uh, and then go on to trastuzumab deruxtecan, reserving neuratinib for a later line of therapy. In patients who do not have brain metastases and who have no history of interstitial pneumonitis, you could treat with trastuzumab deruxtecan followed by tucatinib triplet afterwards because although this is an oral regimen, it uh, is in uh, result in diarrhea, uh, palmar plantar erythrodysesthesia, and a risk of an elevation in liver enzymes. Of course, the risk of a trastuzumab deruxtecan has to be taken into account, and we'll learn more based on these phase three trials about what the relative risk is of trastuzumab deruxtecan in terms of ILD now that we know the toxicity and are monitoring more closely.
This shows you these trials, which I won't go through in detail, but basically the trials are looking at immunotherapy added to a Cleopatra regimen, uh, TDM1 plus tucatinib uh, versus uh, TDM1 uh, and placebo to try and see if we can further reduce brain metastases and improve efficacy. There are a number of trials looking at trastuzumab deruxtecan. Uh, this trial looking at trastuzumab deruxtecan versus TDM1 that allows brain mats has completed accrual. And then there's another antibody drug conjugate, CID985, that is being evaluated as well. With that, I'll thank you very much for your attention.